Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Faith and Finance Forum, hosted by the Catholic Finance Association and presented by Aquinas Wealth Advisors. We have a great show for you today. We have Borja Berrigan, who's uh, with us uh, visiting New York City from his home in Spain. We're going to cover all kinds of great topics with uh, Mr. Berrigan, who uh, has a really accomplished uh, background in the world of finance, especially faith-based investing, where he's focused most of his time now. And he's visiting the United States right now. He's, he's uh, coming through to us from uh, New York City, where he's in town for the Knapp Institute Conference and some other meetings. So uh, what a blessing to be able to talk to Borja Berrigan today. How are you, sir? I'm very well, John. Thank you very much for this introduction. And it's a pleasure to be with you. This is great. You are the uh, the founder and chairman of uh, Altum Faithful Investing. Do I have that right, or or uh, would you? You got it very right. Yeah, the okay. founder and the and the CEO. I try to oh, bother my team as less as possible. I don't want to go in on their way. They do a very good job. Well, that's good subsidiarity, my friend. So uh, let's start <laughs> with a prayer, shall we? In the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Saint Mother of Maria, God, Mother pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Saint James, patron of Spain, pray for us. Father pray Son, for us. Jesus. There you go. Uh, that's today, right. By right? the way, today is the Virgin of the Pillar, which is the founder of uh, of uh, the Hispanic world. So uh, it's a special day in Spain as well. Praise God. Well, God bless Spain and God bless you, Borja. So this is going to be a great conversation. So. You're in, you uh, tell us uh, you know, right off the bat a little bit about Altum Faithful Investing because I know it is a it is a unique organization with a very distinctive purpose. Okay, in order to explain to you what Altum is, I need to give a little bit. I, I need to give you some background. Sure. Well, basically, I've always been doing uh, investment banking. I started in Goldman Sachs City Group in RBS, a UK bank, and then at the end of my career in uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, actually. Um, always been a faithful guy, always been to church and so on, but everything changed at some point. And this was when I started doing a, a master's degree in family apostolate by the St. John Paul II Institute. And there, one thing happened, which is I rediscovered my true vocation uh, towards marriage. It's my wife, Carolina. Uh, and obviously, I decided to put Christ in the middle and in the center of my life. And once you do that, the rest of the things start getting ordered, right? So my leisure, my hobbies, and especially my job. So um, this led me to into a discernment process where I actually had to make a choice whether I should continue doing what I was doing in financial markets at Bank of America Merrill Lynch that I enjoyed, or I should put my talents in something that could actually help institutions that have been, have been accompanying me throughout all my life. In this case, religious institutions, because one thing I got aware was that um, religious institutions, at least in Europe, and this is something I'm discovering over here in the US where they are much better taken care of, I have to say, in Europe, there is a lot of um, ignorance in terms of how they invest their proceeds, right? And they are not able to have a proper faithful approach toward investments. So this made me think, what can I do in order to help them? Um, and the final result was that uh, I left Bank of America Merrill Lynch. I went to Harvard in order to study um, a program that was there for sustainable finance and investments. And the sustainability part, sustainability part is not the most important one. Actually, what was important is that I discovered there what an endowment is. Because you guys in the US, everybody knows what an endowment is. But in Europe, the culture of endowment is almost non-existent. So if Harvard is working for so that the you know, the alumni and the students in 50 years' time have the same opportunities as the students now that is perfectly applicable into a religious congregation. So I came back um, to Spain, and the result was the um, the origin and the start of Altum Faithful Investing, which in a shout, in a nutshell, what we do is we accompany um, religious institutions when it comes to faithful investing. Wow, so cool. And this is, uh, let's... Uh... Let's dive a little deeper into your personal background, though. You're 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 sure. uh, you're, you're Spanish. You uh, you you grew up in Spain. What was your what was your early life like? Yeah, uh, I would start especially when 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 I since I got married. Okay, since I got married, I've been the typical Catholic guy, you know, helping in the parish, uh, doing what I could, entering into into many um, uh, catechesis groups in order to get formation, but. Um, what I didn't like of my life, to be fully honest, is that from Monday to Friday, I was a shark, swimming with sharks, 
and I was a very good shark, I have to say, a very good swimmer. Um, and then during the weekend, um, I was a family man, I was a church guy, etc. For me, what I got to learn is that I didn't have a unity of life. And that is why this discernment started, right? Because I, it was not possible that I have two different lives. One, a professional life, and, a, and, uh, and then a religious life or my normal life. What I needed to do is, was to integrate both things where God, for, God comes first and then the rest uh, comes below. I love it. And uh, you are married to Carolina and you have seven children. How did, you and, your, how did you and your wife meet? Um, we met doing, it's a very good question. We met doing a pilgrimage, the Camino de Santiago. It's a pilgrimage, the St. Jacob Way. Uh, back in in 1999, actually, and uh, you know, you know how the saints uh, Saint Santiago does the things. Um, we got along. We had a lot of time to speak about while, while walking, and uh, and we fell in love with each other. And since then, I love it. You know, the Camino is becoming more popular amongst Americans. I don't know if you've noticed that. I am on every conversation that I say that I'm a Spaniard. Uh, everybody tells me I have to make the Camino. So. Everybody's welcome. I'm more than happy to uh, to help you organize it because I'm actually organizing it with the with a movement of families I am in. It is called Families of Bethany. So we are we are doing it as a family together. I'm told that uh, there is an easy route and a hard route. Is that true? Yeah, but we are Catholics. We have to take the hard route always. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the hard route. Where does the hard hard route originate? Uh, the hard route in the one, the, the, the toughest one comes from the Pyrenees, mm. okay? So it, it starts in the Pyrenees and you go basically throughout all the mountains in the north of Spain, uh, which is kind of harder than the one that comes from Madrid, which is which is much more plain because in the north of Spain, basically it rains all the time, right? Mm. So it makes it, it makes it even harder. You know, it's interesting. There was just an article published in the Wall Street Journal this week about uh, the beauty of the north of Spain. Uh, saying it was right. a, a really gorgeous place to visit, so uh, you, you should. And I subscribe that. it. I subscribe <laughs> it. I go. I love going there in the summer. Oh, uh, that's great! Now you live in uh, Madrid, the capital of Spain, right? Uh, are, are you? Yeah, kind of... born and raised. Oh, born that's, and raised that's in Madrid. Well, what's What's Madrid like? I've never been there. T tell me a little about about your town. Uh, Madrid, uh, I would say, it's an it's an awesome place to raise a family. Mm. To be honest, because. Um, I think because of the culture that we have uh, in Spain that we have since ever we've been uh, Catholics, although things are changing, I have to say, um, I think everything is, is surrounded and prepared to be able to raise a family. It mm. is true that I, uh, that I live in the outskirts of Madrid, but that is a personal decision, to be honest, because I love uh, living outside and I have an, a tremendous park very next to, to my house. But uh, even if you live in the city centre, um, you have the sensation that uh, you can see the blue sky very, very often. Wow, that's amazing. I, I encourage everybody to go visit. I, it's on my list. I've been to Please Portugal, but never to Spain. I've, I've heard so many good things. Awesome place as well. Well, my friend, uh, your uh, your faith is, is a big part of your life. Uh, you know, talk to us about that. You know, uh, why why you know do you do you feel so called to the Lord and and your your Catholic faith and the practice of your faith is such a big part of who you are? Do you think? Right. Um, I would say that the motivation was my biggest motivator is St. John Paul II. Mm. I remember there is, a, there is an encyclical of his that is called Christe Fidelis Laici, where, please don't quote me in English because I don't know the quote exactly in English, but it says something like, under this new world, this economical, social circumstances that we live, we lay men and women cannot remain idle. Right? So, it was very encouraging because it somehow tells you that we need to to, step, to stand up and uh, and be proactive in order to uh, change things, right? So this this was kind of the the origin because when I when I was thinking and when I when I was doing what I did in in, in my previous employer, it, I did it very well, I did it very good, but at some point I I was starting to have ethical dilemma, right? So what am I, am I doing this? Is it the right way to do things? Can things be done better, right? And uh, and actually, I got a question from one of my children one day, and they said, eh, "Papa, what do you do?" 
for a job. And I was in fixed income and derivatives, which is something very difficult to explain to, uh, to a child, right? But, uh, but uh, that brought me to think whether uh, I would feel absolutely 100% proud of what I was doing in my day-to-day -day job. And I have to admit that uh, in, in some cases, I was not proud at all. And it was up to me to make the decision whether I wanted to at least to make every single effort uh, to make me feel proud of every single decision that I take. Wow, that's uh, that's awesome. I love that. What are your kids like? You, you have seven of them. Just give us some highlights. <laughs> I have to say all of them are very good. I have a pair of twins in between. They came by, by absolute surprise. Uh, and if I had to define them, I would say that they are honest people. Yeah. They are honest. They know what their strengths are, and they also know what their weaknesses are, and they are they make every effort to to get better. I am. I have to say, I am very proud of them. Yeah, as you should be. That's amazing. So your your background in finance is uh, is very strong. I mean, you worked for uh, firms that we're all familiar with, like Goldman Sachs and World Bank of Scotland, Bank of America, etc. What was your uh, b before you went into evangelization? You know, what was kind of your specialty or your niche within the world of finance? What's your expertise? I was an excellent sales guy. Hmm. I was doing sales of fixed income. Uh, I started with a fixed income currency and commodities, and then I changed into fixed income and interest rate derivatives. Uh, I would say that, that my biggest skill is that um, I gained the trust of the clients, to be honest. And that is, in my opinion, that is the biggest asset that we have. And that is actually when we hire people in, uh, in Altum, in the company, um, I always give the same speech. The, the veterans in Altum always laugh at me because I always say the same things. But uh, my speech is always that the biggest, the only asset that they have with, with Altum and with myself is trust and reliability. That's the only thing because the rest of the things, we will teach them. They can learn it. There are technical skills that if they work hard, they will get it. But there are some skills that, my friend, you only learn at home. Uh, and that is sacrifice effort, commitment, and trust and reliability. And especially those, they are very difficult to gain, but you can lose them very, very quickly. So I always tell, tell my team to, uh, to take care of those two specifically, not only internally in Altum, but also with the clients. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I feel like sales is just one of those professions where, you know, especially if you're going to do it at a high level, you have to have uh, very strong integrity, high character. And of course, you have to have the hustle. You have to be willing to work Absolutely. extremely hard and, you know, just really grind. And uh, that's, that's clearly a part of your background. I and mean, have you always been like that? Have you always been kind of a kind of a hustler and a, and a fast mover? I mean, was, does that go back to your childhood or? Yes, I would say so. I mean, I've always I've always regarded the the other one and, and it might be, sound a bit romantic. I don't care, to be honest. But I think that the, the parable of the of the Good Samaritan um, uh, has been always in my mind and the guy in front of me especially if you're a sales guy is not just someone with a big dollar number on top of his head right it is someone that has uh, that has worries that needs to be accountable for the job that he's doing and that to be honest my work as a sales guy is to serve them the best way possible that's it yeah and if you do it well the rewards are immense and uh... exactly one of those is a great relationship with the uh, person you, you've had the fortune to sell to. So uh, that's correct. And uh, in, in the world of finance, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of, I mean, there, most are, are very good, you know, ethical people, of course. I mean, we think highly of our profession, but uh, you know, there's, there's been some ethical challenges in, in, in the past decades, of course, you know, both in the United States and in Europe. Uh, did you have an opportunity to, uh, to face on some of those ethical dilemmas uh, opportunities to do the right thing, perhaps in cases yeah. where it was it was not easy to do so. Would you mind sharing some some anecdotes of that? I would say that at, at least in my case, the biggest dilemma um, has always been around the same thematic, mm. which is um, whether I shall take profit based on the ignorance of the person that I have in front of me. Mm. Because in many cases, and especially if you work in in, in markets, and uh, you know what it is all about. Uh, in many cases, that you want to sell something because you know something that the rest of the people don't know, or on the contrary, you want to buy something because you know that there is a value 
within that stock, within that bond, within that whatever you want to do, uh, that the rest of the people do not see. So um, if that is something because you have done and you have reached, researched, it is fine. That is part of, of your job to try to find opportunities. But if uh, on purpose you are uh, getting rid of something or buying something uh, under the premise that you're going to be damaging someone else, that is tough. That is a very tough decision to make. That uh, it happens to us many times that in in Wall Street or in investment banking, our conscience uh, gets easily erased when we get the paycheck, and especially on bonus mm-hmm. time, right? Mm-hmm. And we kind of uh, delete it and uh, and reset from the very beginning. But you know, we have to be accountable at some point, and uh, at the end of the day, our public is God, and the one who is going to judge us uh, is God, right? So. If I had to give any sort of advice to anyone listening to us is by no means, never, ever, and I again repeat, never, ever, sacrifice your integrity. It is priceless. Mm-hmm. And I am the first one that has sacrificed it. Eh? I have to admit it and I openly say it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for being so vulnerable and open about that. So uh, give us a sense for the scope of your business that you built up. Uh, you know, it was mostly Spanish clients or throughout Europe or even beyond. What was the, what was the university right. you served? Atom started like I would say like uh, many of the companies that uh, we know that have success. I hope Atom successes in the future. Yeah. Um, uh, at the garage of my house, right? I started by myself, um, trying to build up uh, re- this relationship that I was uh, coming to you at the beginning, where the base of those relationships was that I could take independent decisions because you know that in private banking, it is a market where you don't know whether your advisor is showing you the best for you or it's actually showing the product that is paying the biggest rebates or the biggest commissions on the back, right? Um, so that was kind of the, the starting point. And the second pillar that I had very clear in mind is that on every single decision that I, uh, that I suggested or recommended to invest to my clients, um, it could not enter into conflict with the social teaching of the Catholic Church. I had that very clear. I have to say that we we started using at the beginning the typical uh, the the typical uh, ESG rating agencies that are available, um, which from an ESG perspective, and we can come that into that later if you wish, uh, they are okay, but when it comes to morality, uh, I am afraid I didn't find the right solutions. Okay, I saw a lot of smoke, which I mean a lot of visibility, but zero consistency behind. And in many cases, when we wanted to know what was exactly the breach and the reason for not being compliant with the teaching, we didn't get any response. So this led us to think at some point, either, number one, either we close the shop, because if we want to take proper, measured, solid Catholic solutions and recommendations to our clients, uh, we need to be fully objective, or we have to end up doing the analysis ourselves. And that is what finally happened. Uh, so three years ago, we took the decision of do the analysis ourselves, and I have a, a, a glorious um, research team that have built what today is Altum Explorer. Altum Explorer, just in a nutshell, is it's an online plan online platform that helps um, professional investors to build a Catholic consistent portfolios. Because we have one thing very clear: we want we want the Catholic investor to be free. And to be free means, you know, that freedom is to have the, the, the right to choose in order to do the good, right? So we want the Catholic investor to have the, an, a, an, a big enough array and supply of Catholic funds that allow the investor to make the right uh, investment decisions. And in order to do so, you have to approach, and we wanted to approach the factories of, of products, which are financial advisors, asset managers, banks, etc. So that is why we created Aldum Explorer, which is specifically made for those factories of products, those professional investors that actually supply products to the market. Wow, well said. So it sounds like prior to founding Altum, it was more difficult to uh, conduct your business in a way that was congruent with the the teachings of the Catholic Church. Is, is that a if fair we wanted statement? to make it, if we wanted to make it authentic, yes, there yeah. was uh, there was no solution, at least in Europe, that we could see that would help us uh, build solid uh, and authentical 
uh, Catholic portfolios. That is mm -hmm. true. It's common in the United States for you know the, the the biggest financial institutions, the biggest banks, to have to offer you know uh, you know what would be described as a Catholic line portfolio, um, you know within you know their their suite of uh, of products. Is it is is that the case with European banks as well? Are, are, are big banks in Europe offering something like that? Well, I'm afraid not. Faithful yeah. investing in Europe is we are like 50 years behind what you guys have in the US, to be honest. Yeah. And that is also one of the reasons that uh, Alto makes sense in the market, which is mm -hmm. no one else is doing. And I mean, no one else in the sense that there could be some houses that show values-based investing or Christian investing. But if you dig a little bit and you scratch and you try to see what is behind, unfortunately, there is only ESG behind mm. where it is always talked about CO2 emissions and toxic waste and the use of water. Mm. But when we have to talk about themes that apply directly towards a uh, Catholic social teaching, and especially the thematics that are currently on the table, I'm talking about gender ideology, I'm talking about abortion, contraception, and especially nowadays, religious freedom. All the big multinationals cannot speak up. They are not free to speak up about certain mm. subjects, right? So mm. that is why I think it is also a virtue that uh, we have in Altum, which is that we are free to speak with, there is a Latin word that I love, which is parecia, which means to be able to, uh, to, be, to speak freely about the truth. So is there any market for faith-based investing in Europe? I mean, is, is there anybody that's into this? There is plenty of market, okay. because in my humble opinion, uh, religious institutions in Europe are being misattended in the sense that the financial institutions that cover them uh, do not have the right tools to offer them uh, products consistent with their faith. Mm. That is why our ambition, and if you look into our website, we have a mission, which is to evangelize the world of finance. We don't want to, to we don't want to be the, the house that has the most religious institutions as clients. No, that is not our purpose. I I wish there were hundreds of entities like, like Altum that can treat their clients um, properly and making sure that they are investing with integrity. So that is why we're actually approaching, we have a very good approach towards it's a bit to be business towards the in, towards the financial industry and the professional asset managers, so that they can actually uh, have a third party that will do the screening for them. They do the financial part, which is what they know how to do best, and offer the best product to their clients. Where in one so call it fund, call it ETF, call it discretionary mandate, the client can get the best of what, of both worlds. That is excellence in terms of financial management, but also purity when it comes to, to the ethicals. Very interesting. So, uh, you know, one thing we see in America when somebody moves from a conventional portfolio to, a, you know, a Catholic aligned portfolio or, or, or some, you know, variation within that definition, you know, they're very surprised at the kind of things that their conventional portfolio is underwriting. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, abortion, pornography, uh, weapons of, of great destruction, uh, just all this, all this terrible stuff. Do your clients at Altum see that too once they dig in and see what they're actually underwriting? Absolutely. Because, and, and it is, it is actually worrying. And one of the main, one of the main outcomes that come when you, when you do an analysis of, of a portfolio is that, well, there are a couple of headlines, but the first headline would be that the bigger the companies are, that is the more market cap a, a company has, the more probability there is that this company is non-compliant. Why? Not because the activity that they do enters in conflict with the teaching of the church. No, no, no. It is because they have so much money that they are implementing it in policies that they implement as a company at the company level that enter in conflict directly with the social teaching. And it is a pity. And you also and you also realize that many, many of the fund managers, you may you may have 10 funds in your portfolio. But out of the 10, the top 10 uh, contributors into each fund, they are almost the same. Right? So you can actually see 
that many of the funds are investing in exactly the same companies. Why? Because they are the biggest companies, but at the same time, they are the most compliant companies, right? So it is a, it is a, it's a first headline. And we always, we have a lot of feedback from asset managers saying, listen, Borja, you're making our life more complicated, right? Because instead of buying the typical fans that are easy to buy and, you know, their growth companies are going to keep growing, et cetera, we need to do our homework. And I tell them, yes, as we were saying before, there is the, the easy way and the hard way, but there is there are plenty of companies you can invest in that maybe you have not analyzed or are not the usual suspects, but that can be as profitable and, a, and have a, a performance as good as any conventional portfolio. Yeah, outstanding. Folks, we're on with Borja Berrigan, the founder and CEO of Altum Faithful Investing. Uh, lives in Spain, but he's in New York City this week, and we're uh, lucky to have a few minutes with him. You're on with the Faith and Finance Forum. Borja, let's uh, get your reaction to the ESG phenomenon. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. our organization, the Catholic Finance Association, hosted a, a debate on this actually earlier this year. We had nice. two uh, great Catholic panelists on. One was very uh, was very uh, uh, supportive of ESG and 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 a, and a advocate for it. Uh, our other panelist uh, was somewhat more skeptical and uh, and negative about uh, ESG. And it, right. was, it was a good, it was a good, honest, uh, you know, debate between two uh, two honorable Catholic men that had different uh, viewpoints on it. Where do you fall on, uh, on on ESG? What's your reaction to it? Let me let me make an analogy. Um, you know, the two percent the view that uh, that I hold on ESG. Imagine that you are in the night of the Super Bowl. Okay, that you are at your place, and that you want you go to the fridge because you want to have a beer but the fridge is empty. There are no beers. But at, at that point, knock, knock. Your best friend is knocking at your door with eight cold beers and you open the door to let him in. This is exactly what I think ESG is. That is, you open the door to something that seems to be very good, yeah. but you have to be very careful as well because it can be actually a Trojan horse. Okay? And uh, understand me well. Some people are saying that ESG has become some sort of even a religion that mm -hmm. needs to be followed, right? So if ESG is a religion that needs to be followed, what, who is the god of that religion? And uh, you can name it, but normally the god is either development, mm. whatever that means, <laughs> or sustainability, whatever that means, right? So if you ask me, is ESG good for faithful investing or even to, to, for the church, my answer would be, it is good, it is extremely good, as long as the center of ESG remains human dignity. Mm. If you remember on the social teaching of the church, what it says, it, it must help the integral development of the human person. Mm. So the moment that we forget about the integral development of the human person and about the dignity, and actually the person becomes an instrument for that word development or sustainability, it is then where I think that ESG is not, the current approach to ESG is not proper from a, from a Catholic perspective. Wow, very well said and concisely said as well. So Borja, you know, uh, along the lines of this, uh, you know, what you're talking about, the, you know, the corporations perhaps uh, almost getting to the point where they see ESG as, as a religion in and of itself. You know, I remember when I was growing up, uh, Man, uh, you you couldn't tell if uh, Coca Cola or uh, Ford Motor Company or or any any company in the United States or beyond, you didn't know if they were liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat. They just uh, they manufactured uh, you know soft drinks or cars or or, or whatever. But now uh, it's different. Uh, you know these these companies have become very political, uh, very engaged in in kind of the uh, cause celebs of, of the day. They're always taking political stances. You know they're clearly ideological. Uh, well, which, what do you think about all that? I mean, that's, has, that, has that been good for society? Has that been good for business? St. John Paul II, in the war, in the letter Familiaris Consortio, he has to say in an apologies because I know it in Spanish, but not in English, but uh, it says something like, family, be what you are, right? In this specific case, under the social teaching of the church, we could apply it to the corporate world saying, companies, be what you are, in the sense that you have an activity, you sell services, you sell products, 
do it efficiently, pay well to your people, uh, be better than competition, try to improve, uh, treat well your stakeholders, etc. That is your duty. And if you do it efficiently, you will actually create a profit, which is excellent. Now the companies have changed uh, a little bit their view and they are becoming uh, activists from a political perspective and positioning themselves, which uh, to some point, it actually forces the, uh, the religious freedom of their stakeholders and especially of the, even their employees in the sense that why do employees of a certain company have to, have to be forced to a, a change in the logo of their company during the month of June, for example. Why do the employees need to tell anyone what their pronouns are? That is forcing their, you know, twisting their arm from a religious perspective that it, it's, at some points it actually gets, gets violent because the problem with it is that if you do not comply, then our beloved cancellation culture arrives. And I would, I can openly tell you that cancellation culture, it is not Catholic, not at all. Does that happen in Europe as well? Cancellation? It is, it is happening, not to the stance that I am reading and I am feeling in the US, but, uh, but it is, it is worldwide, I would say, because nowadays with the social media, uh, you cannot escape from cancellation. Basic. That's it. Mm, indeed. So with, with Altum Faithful Investing, uh, you offer a, uh, a a product for a or a faithful Catholic or even just a a regular person that wants to have a moral portfolio and not invest in, in evil and in immoral activity that they can yeah. be assured that a hundred percent of their investments are aligned with their uh, with their beliefs. Talk to us about how you keep that promise to the investor. Right. Um... As I, I was mentioning to you before that we have Altum Explorer, which is addressed yes. towards the um, professional asset managers so that they can build professional portfolios following the teaching of the church. However, that was not sufficient for us. Let, let me explain you why. And this comes the second objective of Altum, which is if Catholic means universal, faithful investing shall be available for absolutely everyone, independently of the amount of savings or the amount of wealth that you have. And as you know, many of the asset managers or private banking or financial advisors only accept you if you have sufficient amount of wealth, let's put it that way, if you are rich. Or if you're a congregation that has uh, proceeds, excellent. But what happens with the retail people? What happens to my mother with my brother, you know? Uh, that they don't have wealth, but they want to make some investments. This resulted in uh, creating Altum App. Altum App is basically a light version of the Altum Explorer, which is for professional investors, but it is absolutely available for everyone, where basically you can download it either, either from the Apple Store or, sorry, not the Google Store, because they didn't like what we said about Google, and you can download it directly from our website. That's uh, things that happen. Was that was that uh, cancellation? Oh, you said that I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Right. So you can you can actually down, download it either for Android or or for iPhone, and it is actually a checkpoint. It's a checkpoint to see before you go to your online broker and decide whether you want to buy a Bank of America or not, or want to buy Santander or Telefonica. You basically check it, and you are able to see in the app whether. Uh, that company would enter into conflict by any of the four pillars that we cover, which is uh, promotion of family, human dignity, life, and care and protection of creation. It will appear there, and then you take your decision. We believe in freedom, but at least you can take an informed decision as of whether that company enters in conflict with the teaching or not. So ultimately, the investor decides. I mean, you provide the information, and the investor decides. Correct. You know where that fits into her, you know, moral framework. Okay. That's correct. Interesting. Okay, very good. And how's it going? I mean, like, uh, how, how, how's how's the company doing? We are we are overwhelmed, to be honest. I'm very very grateful. We are very grateful for the for the confidence that uh, our clients are depositing in us. Uh, I am, and I have to say, I'm very grateful for the great team that I have behind. Because when when you are able to work with people that are aligned 
and you know that have the same vision and have the same targets, uh, it is amazing. And I would say that that is the fruit of that we are now collecting is because we have been seeding and the whole team has been seeding in the in the right way. What are our ambitions? To be honest, I, I, I've been here for three days already in the, in the US. And there are a couple of things that have caught my attention, if I may. Number one is that whenever I hear a US person talk about God and about Christ, you can feel that their heart is burning. It is amazing. Eh? Uh, so there is... There is deep faith over there, and people are not ashamed of their faith. I think that is something that we are living in Europe, unfortunately. I think there is a word, the translation in English is lukewarm, not, right? That you are not neither hot, neither cold. You are indifferent. You are in between. And that is something that we're living in, uh, uh, in Europe, unfortunately. But what I have felt over here is this uh, apostolic jealousy that you want to push uh, the, to be an apostle. Um, and also that people are starting to realize that faithful investing can actually go an extra mile. That faithful investing is not just about ESG, but it is actually about bringing the morals into uh, into the portfolio. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And, and you know, it is, I guess it, it's one of the things I'm very proud of my country that you know, we do have this deep and rich Christian tradition, you know, both uh, Catholic and, and the other Christian denominations, it, at least for now, I mean, yeah. you, you, you can feel, feel very comfortable proudly stating that, you know, and uh, uh, it's, it's you know, there, there's there's evidence that's changing a little bit. And I, I think a lot of us are very concerned about that. But uh, no, I mean, just uh, the devotion to the Lord and to Jesus Christ in the United States is just, it's just so strong, and uh, it, it's one of the one of the things I think has attracted people to this country from other parts of the world uh, for, mm -hmm. for for hundreds of years. Even if even if they're not Christians, they they like the the notion of a country that's based on these Judeo Christian principles, which uh, you know I think represent the uh, you know the highest level of life. You know the uh, you know the, the the Western tradition or the Catholic tradition, however you look at it, uh, rule of law, equal uh, rights, yeah. protection of the human person. Um, you know, just a free economy, a limited government, you know, all these principles that mm. country is based on, they're very unique in the world, right? Mm. I, I can see that there is thirst for God. Yeah. I, let me give you two, two examples. Example number one, uh, I was able to attend the, the Eucharistic procession that, that yes. took place from St. Patrick uh, uh, through the streets of New York. It was amazing to see the faces of the people. And you could, you could actually see people getting on their knees when the when Jesus was was passing our, uh, through the street, right, and uh, and some people were like saying these guys are crazy. Okay, why are they walking and everybody's silent or singing, etc. But in some faces, you could actually see tears coming out. So th there is a seed that, let's say, the culture wants to get rid of of our hearts. But the moment that you get in touch with uh, with Jesus, it changes things. Jesus transforms. He can actually transform your face. It takes you to the down, bring, bring you to tears. And, and the second example is that there is a, we have participated lately in the financing of a movie. It is called Free Duke Altum. And it basically shows the beauty of living in a, in a, in a convent on a, or a monastery. Okay? And actually, we're bringing it over to, uh, to, to the U.S. because there are some distributors that have asked for it where apparently there is already a, a waiting list in order to have the movie in the cinemas. So uh, you can actually realize that there is thirst uh, to know more about the religious life and to know more in this specific example, for example, of monks and nuns, who many people think that because they are in jail within the convent and never get out, but these, these people are actually the most free people that, that I have ever seen. Wow. What's the name of that movie you're uh, promoting again? The movie is called Free yeah. Duc in Altum. Duc in Altum, if you remember, if you remember, is the Latin phrase put out in, into the deep, right? The deep, yeah. Take 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 the courage to, to make the next step. Gosh, that's so true. And I think, you know, another thing you touched upon too, when you said that ESG is, is kind of, you know, behaving like religion in a way. I mean, isn't, I mean, I think there's a lot of aspects of the secular world that are behaving like religions, you know, and, and just the, you know, the materialism, the vapidness, the, the belief that happiness can be bought, that it can be commoditized, that if you just have one yeah. more thing, 
if you just, uh, you know, have a girlfriend beside your wife, if you just, uh, you know, just focus your life on hedonism and the next, you know, transient pleasure you can absorb, that that's, uh, that's the path to happiness. And I just don't know how, how, how many times that can be proven wrong, right? But, but John, that is the natural path of secularization. I mean, if you take out of, if you take out of your life, the only thing that can really f fool you and complete you, you need to find it somewhere else. You need to find it in in if you are if you are married, uh, you need to find it in another woman. If you want to in, in the money, you need more money. Mm -hmm. Why? Just for the sake of it, because it is it gives you a false security as well. Mm -hmm. You need to. I don't know if this happens in the U.S. or not, but uh, among many friends of us, if you haven't uh, thrown yourself uh, with a parachute, if you haven't gone to Thailand, if you haven't experienced many experiences that are very exciting, you're a loser. Yeah. You know, and me, I cannot be more happy than with my seven children, my wife, a chimney, a, a glass of whiskey, and a book. To be fully honest. Don't I don't need any more. I, 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 don't, I don't need to go to Thailand, right? So what I want to okay. say, and please forgive me people that go to Thailand because I'm sure it's a lovely country. Sure. But what I, what I want to say is that we are sensation seekers. Why? Because we are empty in, yes. in our hearts, right? Yes. And, and also, I think some of the characteristics of modern life are, frankly, soul crushing. You know, I mean, young people that, you know, they go to work and they spend the entire day staring at spreadsheets or responding to email or you know, going to uh, team meetings, you know, which sometimes, you know, have no point, you know, I mean, it, that can, that can take your soul away too. And uh, I, I guess one of the challenges in, in the business world is, is to humanize it, right. To make it, to make it one where, you know, a person is not necessarily just staring at a screen or a phone all day, but instead is doing something go. that lifts the heart more, right. I think that the, the phone, the screen, uh, it is killing the way we, yeah. we create relationships. I mean, now if, if you, well, when, when you were single and I was single, if you wanted to get out with a girl, you know, it, it took some time. You yeah. had to invite her for a walk, invite her for a Coca-Cola, sure. uh, you know, visit her parents, etc. It took some time, but it was worth it. Oh, yes. yes. Now they want everything with a swipe of the finger. It is a yes, it is a no, it is a match. And the problem is that from a cultural perspective, given that we want everything now, even even uh, sex relationships that are just for the marriage, uh, given that we want to have them now, we made them earlier than uh, we actually should. And uh, what happens in the end? It leaves, again, an empty heart. Mm. Right? So, uh, yeah, with the youngsters, they don't have a, an, an easy life in front of them. Honestly, no, we need, no. we parents, we need to form our children very well. Mm. And formation here is key. And we have to re recover and retrieve the significance of family. Because mm. to be honest, when I, I'm, maybe I'm just going away from the theme, but nevertheless, if we think uh, about where are, where are the careers that our children are going to be studying, are they going to be businessmen? Are they going to be doctors? Are they going to be whatever they want to be? What is going to be very valuable are the social virtues that they have learned at home. Yes. That's it. Because the rest will come by itself. But the the youngsters that are committed, that know how to work hard, that don't ask you for vacations just for the sake of it, yeah. that uh, know what learning is, that learning, it takes time, experience takes time. If you have youngsters that know that, they will be the kings of the jungle, I promise. Oh, man, so well said. You know, while we still have some time, I want to get into some other interesting parts about your uh, your background, Borja. Um, you are, uh, you're doing some stuff with the Vatican, right? With the CAP organization and some other stuff. Correct. Talk, talk about, mm -hmm. about, about your service to the Holy See. Okay. Um, the, um, I, I am a board member of the Centesimo Sanos Foundation. The, um, objective of the foundation, it was, it was originated by St. John Paul, uh, II, and it has one objective, which is to disseminate the social teaching of the church within the business world. That is not easy. Eh? I mean, St. John Paul II, he knew what he was doing when, uh, when, when, when he said that, right? And um, I am very familiarized with, the, um, with, the, uh, with all the tasks that are being made um, from the foundation in Europe. Uh, but the U.S. chapter, I have to say, 
it is magnificent. I don't know whether you have had the chance to look into the website, yeah. but if you want to know what the chart is really saying, I know what you read in the headlines on the newspapers that maybe are more ideological or not. If you want to know to go to the fund where everything starts, I would suggest go to the website of CAP US because it explains to you the whole magisterium in a very simple way, but uh, being very faithful to the truth. And on subjects that are we are living at the moment, eh? family, abortion, transgenderism, wokerism, and all that stuff. Highly, highly recommend it, to be honest. Gosh, so good. And, and I am very involved with CAP. I love CAP. Uh, uh, Bob Nualjak, nice. uh, all, all our good friends, mutual friends. Uh, and it's right. a really great organization. I hope our, our, our listeners and viewers will check it out. I'm glad you mentioned that. And uh, and then on the personal side, you mentioned some of your passions, you know, including uh, whiskey drinking and book reading and family stuff. We know that's a big part of your life. But I was also intrigued by uh, the the bow hunting. Tell me a little bit about uh, what, why you enjoy bow hunting so much. Well, I started a, <laughs> I started ten years ago in yeah. a, not with bow hunting, but with bow shooting for precision. I mean, you needed to get it within one centimeter uh, from long distances. But it, it got a time between you and me that I got bored, right? Yeah. Because it was always the same thing. So, um, but I also like mountaineering and I love hiking and I love, you know, being uh, being outside. So um, I started with a friend that invited me uh, to a hunting session uh, with a bow. And I really loved it. To be honest, why? Because I think it's a fair battle between the animal and human intelligence. Uh, and uh, I have to say that uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a very good plan. It's actually a good plan that I can that I can do with with uh, with the kids as well. And I have to say as well that everything that we hunt, we eat it ourselves. Yes, yes. So uh, don't complain on that side. No, I love that. That's so cool. And and uh, you share you and I share that in common too. I used to be an archery instructor back in the day, and uh, all right, one of, the, one of the nice things about uh, you know shooting bows and as opposed to guns is that the ammunition is reusable, which of course uh, saves you some money too, which is nice. That's, <laughs> that is that's, true. <laughs> that's cool. You take your kids hunting. Uh, what's the what's the hunting culture like in Europe? Is is it generally like you can go out, or is it heavily regulated? How would you describe the culture around it? It is it is it is very regulated, sure. which I, I'm not against it. I mean, I think sure. it, it, it it makes sense for. Yeah. For the purpose of hunting, of the control of the of the of the animals, yeah. uh, I would say it is it is getting very expensive. Mm. Don't ask me why, but uh, it is getting too 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 expensive. But uh, you know, some people like skiing, which is also expensive. Other like me, we like hunting uh, and and uh, I'm fishing as well. So, but uh, the culture, unfortunately, what I'm sensing is that it is getting it is getting lower and lower. Mm. Because people, because you have been hunting, you know that hunting implies patience many yes. times, right? Yes. And being cold at night, maybe you go and you don't hunt anything at all. And as we were saying before, the culture today does not reward that especially, right? So mm. um, I think that is, it is also one of the reasons why it is going down. Okay, very interesting. So besides Spain, what is the most beautiful country in Europe? Portugal. Portugal. Tell me about Portugal. Portugal. Why do you like Portugal? Uh, I like the Portuguese people. They are very humble. They are hard workers. They uh, they are able to to appreciate the value of life, mm. to be honest. Eh? And they can they can they are people that can that are very happy with, with they don't need many things to be happy. Mm. So uh, especially the north. I was I I, I go I go in the summer. I go to uh, Gafania to a monastery of Schoenstatt that they have a house there, and I will stay. The family we stay there in, with the nuns over there, and um, and I can I can say I, I would recommend it. Don't go during when I go because otherwise you will take my place. But after <laughs> I go, uh, you're more than welcome to to go over there. It's a, it's a great it's a great place. It's still cheap. You eat very well. Now nah, fully recommendable. Yeah, I've heard it's relatively. Uh, I've been to Portugal actually ten years ago. I, I was at, actually at a wedding in Portimao, which is the opposite of what you're saying. That's in the extreme south southwest right. corner of Portugal, actually the most southwest corner of continental Europe. Very beautiful though, great beaches. And I was impressed at how affordable it was. 
and also the friendliness of the people. I totally agree. And, and you know, it's it's a it's a good flight from the United States. You can get from JFK to Lisbon. I mean, what's the flight? Four hours, maybe. I mean, and, you know, maybe a little bit more. But you know, it's it's not bad at all. It's very accessible. Have you ever been to the Azores? No, never. Oh my god, never. I'd love to. That's on my list too. So, Borja, <laughs> you know, while we have a, a, just a few minutes left, I mean, just give me. Give me the vision for, for Altum moving forward. You've done a great job of expressing what you're up to now with it and, and the unique products you provide. But, you know, what's the what's the you know five year, 10 year vision for this very, very exciting firm you're leading? Um, that's a very good question. I would say um, the future of Altum is that if we want to if we want to get far, we and I'm going to be speaking about faithful investing in general. Okay, one of the things that, that I am saying, uh, John, and uh, and I'm sure I really like it. I'm not sure, um, is that there are quite a few um, faithful investing firms around. Okay, some are bigger, some are smaller, uh, but I have the sensation that at some point we should sit down and talk with each other, because it seems to some points. Let me give you an example. In Spain, we have many uh, associations that are pro-life, but every every one of them goes their way. So they achieve absolutely nothing, right? If they came together, if they sat down and set, set up um, common grounds, their impact and their capability to save lives would be definitely much higher. I think something similar should happen in faithful investing. And I open my arms to to be honest, to embrace anyone who wants to to sit down and have a chat because I think that um, we could take the best practices of each company and actually create something together. I'm not saying that we create one as a manager to manage all. No, 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 no. I'm saying, hey, one, why don't let's go together and create a an abortion-free portfolio, that an index that anyone can replicate in their own way. Then each asset manager, I don't know, they can... They can do the, their secret sauce from a financial perspective, but the ethics behind are very authentic and very clean. That is something that I would like to put on the table. And that is where I see the future of faithful investing. Not everyone going their own way, you know, trying to steal clients from each other. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the good for the church. Another example, why don't we sit down and create a clean pharma portfolio? Because mm. pharma companies... They can be the worst in the world, mm. but they can actually be the ones that invent mal- uh, the solution for malaria. Mm-hmm. So why don't we invest in those ones specifically? Why don't we create a clean portfolio of pharma companies? And of course, why not make money out of it? So yeah. if I if, if, if answering to your question, mm-hmm. uh, I think that the future of faithful investing in general is comes through getting together because at the end of the day, John, it is some sort of creating communion among ourselves as well. And this is what it is all about at the end of the day. Yeah, it's clear you're, you're very interested and comfortable with collaboration and uh, teaming up with like-minded organizations, you know, to absolutely you know, scale this and, and build it out. I think it's great. And, you know, something I always try to bring up in these conversations too, is there's a misconception out there too. I, I can't believe it's still out there, but uh, that, you know, you're going to sacrifice returns uh, by having a, a Catholic portfolio, a faith line, you know, portfolio. That's that's yeah. simply not true, right? You're, you still enjoy fantastic <laughs> returns, right? Yeah. That is a myth, my friend. Yeah. I mean, that is an absolute yeah. myth. Let me tell you. There is, there, is, there is absolutely no principle of causality that if you have a faithful portfolio, you will have a better return. That I can promise you. What will make you have a better return is the talent of your portfolio manager Mm. as simple as that but what i can tell you as well is that your portfolio manager can actually create an excellent portfolio and a very solid portfolio from an economical and financial perspective with companies that do not enter in conflict with the teaching how do you evaluate that talent on the front end i mean let's say you're you're new to investing or perhaps you're you're switching over from an advisor that you've had for years, but you're, you're going to try a new relationship. You know, what yeah. are your tips for evaluating a, a really strong, talented advisor that's going to, you know, help you grow <laughs> your investments, but also do it in an ethical way? Very good. Well, imagine that I didn't know anything about numbers and about finance and I just wanted to invest. 
what I, the reasons why I would choose, a, choose an advisor is number one, that the advisor is independent, okay? I can be the only one paying the advisor. There should be no other second uh, income sources for the advisor so, so that our interests are always aligned. Um, and then I would, I would actually choose advisors that really know the companies they are investing in, in the sense that uh, for me, investing in a portfolio of companies that has 250 names in there, that is over diversification, to be fully honest. That is trying to replicate an index at the end of the day. But how much alpha it adds, I'm not quite sure, to be honest. So I prefer to sit down with uh, portfolio managers that maybe they have a concentrated portfolio of 35, 45 names. Perfect. But they have sat down with the management. They have sat down with investor relations and they know the risks, um, the risk of, of the activity. They know the modes of the company that they may have and they have a plan as of why the company is going to be growing. And they can measure whether that those uh, that research and analysis that they have made um, actually gets fulfilled or, or not. And if they have made a mistake, no problem at all. I mean, we all make mistakes and we also know, we who are in finance, that a little bit of luck plays a big role as well when it comes to investing. A bit of luck and timing. So uh, we are not, we not any, no one of us has the crystal ball. So I would just require that they are independent and that they know the companies very, very well. Well, my friend, I hope that your luck continues to be uh, very good and uh, I wish, <laughs> wish you Godspeed and all the best with Altum Faithful Investing. What a, what a unique and interesting company. Borja, for uh, members of our audience that would like to uh, learn more about you and Altum and perhaps connect with you, uh, how can mm -hmm. they best find you? I think the best, the best thing that they can do is to send an email to info at altum-fi.com. That's the best thing. Uh, because I will probably, I will be personally reading the email. So please feel, feel free to send it there. Well, I hope many will. Well, listen, uh, my friend, uh, this has been such an interesting conversation. I'm so glad we were able to work it into your trip to New York City. Any final thoughts for our audience before we sign off? Um, yes, I would like to, I would like to encourage a, financial advisors, investment professionals, or even laymen that are administrators of the money of the church, uh, do not fear, have no fear. Because in many cases, one of the, most of the objections that I hear is that, oops, if I implement faithful investing now, I'm going to be putting on the table that I have not been doing it in the last years. And that might be a bit embarrassing for me. My dear friend, it is not about that. It is about making the best for the church. So if actually there you have the opportunity to invest in a better way, in a more consistent way with the Catholic teaching, my suggestion is to take it. Nobody's going to point you for, uh, for what you have done in the past, but you actually might get pointed if you don't have, if you don't take the opportunity to improve your investments now that there is a possibility to, to do it. So as St. John Paul II says, uh, and you can see that I like him very much. Have no fear. Go for it. Yes, indeed. Faith over fear. And with uh, tools like those offered by Altum Faithful Investing, uh, there's just no excuse anymore. You can know exactly what you're getting into and you can make the changes that you should. This has been incredible. Uh, Borja Berrigan, founder and CEO of Altum Faithful Investing. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate the conversation. Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure talking to you. This has been the Faith and Finance Forum, hosted by the Catholic Finance Association and presented by Aquinas Wealth Advisors. We'll see you next time. God bless. God bless.